Okay, so welcome to this next video on pulmonary arterial hypertension. So, we've discussed that in pulmonary arterial hypertension, what happens is the pulmonary arteries, uh, and all the arterioles as well, are too contracted, basically. The, um, the lumen of those blood vessels is too narrow. So, effectively, you're squashing a, your uh, blood that's being delivered by the right ventricle into the pulmonary system into a smaller space, and then that's causing the blood to push on the side of the wall, uh, the side of the um, blood vessel wall, with a greater force, and that's what is called pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH. Right, so we're trying to understand the pathophysiology of that so that we can understand how this new drug, Rio Ciguat, uh, Rio Ciguat, or however you want to pronounce it, uh, works to combat pulmonary artery, uh, arterial hypertension. Okay, uh, so we've discussed that you get some sort of dysfunction of the endothelial cells um, that line uh, these blood vessels of the pulmonary arterial system so that they produce less nitric oxide than they should do. Okay, now, let's just remind ourselves of the mechanism by which nitric oxide produces relaxation uh, within a smooth muscle cell. So let's say this is a smooth muscle cell. Whoops. Okay, so this is a smooth muscle cell. Right, now, in the smooth muscle cell, there are soluble uh, guanylate cyclase enzymes. Okay, so we draw our soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme here. Okay. So, um, here are the, um, well, let me draw it in full, actually. I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit it in now. Let's put it in here. Okay, so here is our soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme. So, it consists of two subunits, an alpha subunit and a beta subunit. So, on the left, I've drawn the alpha subunit. On the right, I've drawn the beta subunit. Okay, and basically, each of these subunits contributes half of the catalytic uh, portion of the enzyme. So each one of them at the bottom here, which I'll draw in blue, has a catalytic domain. And basically these catalytic domains are half of the active guanylate cyclase enzyme. So uh, they're going to dimerize, basically, and that will be the active guanylate cyclase enzyme here now. Okay, uh, so uh, up on this, um, these higher domains, and by the way, the, these two domains here are known as HNOX domains, and I should have drawn this on this side, so let me draw it on this side, because otherwise I'll get in the way of what I want to do later. So the, these are HNOX domains, and HNOX, which I'll just write up here, HNOX stands for heme uh, nitric oxide uh, slash oxygen binding domain. So heme nitric oxide slash oxygen binding domain. So they took the H for heme, they took the NO for nitric oxide, they took, well actually I think they took the N for nitric oxide, and then the ox for oxygen, that would make more sense, oxygen binding domain. Okay, right, so both the alpha and the beta subunit of the uh, of this uh, soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme both have one of these HNOX domains up here, these heme uh, nitric oxide slash oxygen binding domains, which I've coloured now in turquoise. And then finally, uh, in the middle here, these are what are known as PAS regulatory domains. These are PAS regulatory domains, and both the alpha and the beta subunit both have a PAS regulatory domain, and these uh, have bonds between one another, so the, each of the PAS regulatory domains have links between one another. So I'll colour in the PAS regulatory domains in pink here. Okay, so that's the structure of our uh, soluble guanylate cyclase enzyme, and I just want to stress that these two subunits are known as alpha-1 and beta-1. So this is the alpha subunit, and this is the beta subunit. Now, there are two alpha subunits that are known to be significant within humans, um, and they're the alpha-1 and the alpha-2. In vascular smooth muscle, it is the alpha-1 that is used uh, to, make the, um, to make the guanylate cyclase enzyme, and beta-1 is always used, as far as we've um, found. Okay, right. 
Now, this is almost the structure complete, but in fact, we've missed out one extremely important prosthetic group. So, off the side of this h nox group, specifically on the beta-1 subunit, not on the alpha-1 subunit, you have a histidine residue, which is histidine 105. Now, histidine basically forms a coordinate bond with an iron uh, cation that is at the center of a porphyrin ring, i.e. a heme group. So here is our heme group, which consists of this iron cation, this ferrous cation, because it's an iron cation uh, which has a divalent positive charge, and it's coordinated within this uh, uh, porphyrin ring to make a heme group. Now, in the heme group, it already has four coordinate bonds, so one, two, three, four. But this ferrous iron cation can actually support uh, six uh, coordinate bonds. It can have one from this side as well, and another one from this side. So the histidine forms one from this side. Okay, so the soluble guanonate cyclase enzyme usually has this prosthetic heme group sticking off the side of it, basically. So this is this prosthetic heme group. Okay, now, when nitric oxide arrives from the endothelium, it diffuses across this uh, phospholipid bilayer of the smooth muscle cell and into the cytoplasm of the smooth muscle cell. It then finds this soluble guanonate cyclase enzyme, which is usually just abbreviated as SGC for soluble guanonate cyclase. It finds that in the cytoplasm of the cell, and it then forms the sixth coordinate bond that this ferrous cation can support. So here's our nitric oxide molecule forming this sixth coordinate bond. Now when nitric oxide forms that sixth coordinate bond, it causes this fifth coordinate bond between the histidine uh, at position 105 and the ferrous cation to, um, to break apart, basically. So what happens is this prosthetic heme group breaks off the soluble guanonate cyclase and goes off with the nitric oxide. And now that leads to the activation of this soluble guanonate cyclase enzyme. Okay, so the catalytic portion of the, the actual enzyme portion down here, made up of these two catalytic domains of um, the, um, each one of these subunits, is now going to start converting uh, guanosine triphosphate into uh, cyclic guanosine monophosphate, cyclic GMP, and also the other product that you get from this conversion is pyrophosphate, often denoted PPI. That's just two phosphate groups linked together. Right, so what happens is nitric oxide causes a certain amount of cyclic GMP um, production within the smooth muscle cell. So all the time, these endothelial cells in your arteries are releasing nitric oxide uh, that is diffusing up to your smooth muscle cells and causing a certain amount of cyclic GMP to be produced in those smooth muscle cells. Okay, so now let's look at the actions of cyclic GMP. So cyclic GMP activates an enzyme known as uh, protein kinase G. Okay, so this is protein kinase G. Now, another name for protein kinase G is the cyclic GMP-dependent protein kinase. So this is also known as the cyclic GMP-dependent protein kinase. Okay, and uh, it is a serine threonine kinase so it adds phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues of proteins. Okay, so which proteins is it going to interact with? Well, basically, it's going to phosphorylate proteins, and the way it phosphorylates proteins, it's going to lead to, uh, well, the combination of proteins that it activates and inhibits is going to basically lead to relaxation of this uh, smooth muscle cell.